I'm Sorry. going to decide that we have um, that we have a quorum. And um, Jonathan from Marshfield. Um, oh, that, that was him. Hold on one second. He's um, he got a wisdom tooth taken out today, so he'll be joining us by phone if I can get him straightened. Try to catch up with him as, as we go. So it's I have uh, 604. <clears throat> I will call the April 9th, 2019 meeting of the CB Fiber Governing Board to order. Um, any additions or changes to the agenda? Okay. Um, I'm going to add. Um, I don't know if Rama is here or coming or anything. Uh, I didn't put the financial policies on the agenda this time around. The ones that we had talked about at the last meeting. Um, that was an oversight on my part, and I was, if Rama was going to be here, um, I was going to add an item. So I think what I'm going to do is I will add that to the end of the agenda, and if he shows up, then we will discuss those, and if not, we won't. Um, great. Uh, any public comment? Any uh, commentary on anything uh, that's not on the agenda? Yeah. So the, I mailed you, just to let everybody else know, I did put in for a uh, Cabot Community Cabot has a, an investment fund called the Cabot Community Investment Fund, and I put in for $500 to help with our whole match stuff, but now you should find out tonight. They don't know their meeting tonight, whether or not we've got to get approved, just to let everybody know. So. Cool. Jonathan, can you hear me? I can, yes, thank you. Great. I'm going to turn you up to maximum volume so everybody can hear you. This is uh, John Williams uh, from Marshfield uh, filling in for Jim Barlow, who is actually stepping aside from the board as he's been appointed to the Twinfield School District. So. That is correct. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, so uh, in order to uh, abide by state law when we have a board member attending remotely, um, any, any votes that we take need to be done by roll call. So um, sorry well, about that. No, no, it's all good. Um, I don't think we'll have any, anything super contentious, and we don't have a full board here today anyway, so it should, be, um, should go reasonably quickly. Um, and there are a handful of people here who are um, who are maybe not new to the board, but who are new to other folks. Um, so uh, if we do a round of introductions, um, I'll start, and then John will ask you to do the same, and we'll go around counterclockwise here, or clockwise here. So I'm Jeremy Hansen, the chair from Berlin. Uh, Jonathan Williams from the town of Marshfield. Which way do you want to go? Yep. This way. Um, Phil Hayek from Middlesex. I'm Tom McMurdo. I'm new. I'm the alternate from East Montpelier. Andrew Gilbert, delegate from Cabot. Skip Lindsay, newly appointed delegate from Woodbury. Jeremy Matt, alternate from Plainfield. Barry Bernstein, president of the Board of Washington Electric Co op. Jerry Diamantides, alternate from Berlin. David Healy, delegate from Callis. Bob Burley, delegate from Elmore. Tom Fisher, representative for East Montpelier. My turn. Michael Birnbaum, uh, delegate from Plainfield. Jared Thomas, alternate from Cows. Okay, I think we've got everybody now. Um, moving past public comment, treasurer's report. Let's stick a uh, pin in that one, and uh, when Becca arrives, we can uh, 
come back to that. If she doesn't arrive in the next <coughs> hour or so, uh, I have some information that I can share with you, and we can come back, um, come back to that. So we're going <coughs> to skip that one for the moment. <coughs> Valiant meeting. Um, uh, we were invited to have a meeting with Valinet, which to bring everybody up to speed, and for those, for those of you that don't remember um, or that don't know, EC Fiber is a communications union district just to the south of us, comprising 24 towns, actually, including Montpelier, one of our member towns. Um, they do not have any employees. They do not um, do anything day to day except uh, have board meetings like this. The day-to-day -day operations are done by ValleyNet, which is a nonprofit internet service provider that does <coughs> everything, basically. Um, I had previously spoken with, uh, with them, asking them if they would be willing to consider being our uh, operator, our operating company, and uh, with the idea that we would look at the, um, the budget that we had put together for this year, sort of aspirationally that we build five or six miles of fiber in Roxbury or Northfield or something like that. And I asked them what they thought and they said, two small potatoes, not anything that we'd be interested in doing. The, uh, the costs of them ramping up and getting, um, getting some, like, something like that working, it just didn't make sense at that scale. Um, so uh, again, an email from uh, Carol Monroe and uh, she said, would you like to come down and talk about how we can work together? And I said, sure. I said, can I bring a board member along? And I happened to be uh, meeting with Jerry about USDA stuff. And I said, Jerry, want to join me? So we zipped down there, and we met with um, we met with Carol and uh, um, Valionet's board chair, whose name is eluding me for the moment. Stan. Stan. Thank you. We met with Carol and Stan, and. Um, and if I'm um, misstating any of this, Jerry, feel, feel free to correct me. It was um, rather surprising when they, they came to us and they said, you know, if this, this thing that the legislature is looking to pass soon, which is essentially putting uh, state-backed loan money in VITA, um, we want to help you write the application for that VITA loan and build and operate your network. And I said, oh, well. That sounds amazing. And they said, you know, let's look at the portions of the network that are contiguous to the existing network that they manage, Roxbury, Northfield, Williamstown. They have customers in Roxbury right now. Um, and uh, yeah, and then it was talking about how that might work, what might happen from there. Um, and they offered to um, essentially give us this, it's like partial business plan for those three lower towns. Um, and we ended up actually, and when Jerry wrote the, the narrative and the, the, the budget for the USDA grant included that as $20,000 of in-kind like financial work, or whatever, I don't know what we, I don't, I don't, uh, did that go in as in kind? Uh, I don't think that went in as in kind. Okay, I, I, yeah, we, we had talked about well, it. It did go in as jobs. Okay. They, they said that, that, you know, it would take this many jobs to get this thing going in the next three years. Okay. I, I know we were talking about both, both of those. No, I take that back. He did put some in kind services in there. You, I stand corrected. Okay. He did put a small amount for in kind in getting it going. So, um, yeah, so they proposed um, essentially getting us going and provided that we can come up with the money, in this case, the, the, uh, the VITA grant that is not even quite approved yet. Um, VITA loan. What's that? Yeah. The VITA loan, thank you. The VITA loan. Um, but that they would essentially get us started, which is, which to me was incredible. I mean, and I think the, um, the thing that, that they were looking for in exchange was essentially some guarantee that they would continue to be the operator for a stretch of time, like three, five years, something like that, didn't they say? Yes, but it was short, it was relatively short term, mm -hmm. and it also was not going to be an exclusive agreement so that if we wanted to do something in the north end, let's say, of the service area, <coughs> they wouldn't have any control whatsoever over that. Okay. We would be free to use multiple operators, if you will, if we wanted to. And this was purely a discussion. We, mm -hmm. we never got 
they, they were going to follow, follow up with something written, I thought. And, and, they, and they expect that they still will. Okay. Yeah, they just haven't put this Yeah, I haven't seen <clears throat> So just, I'll put that out there. I mean, that's my, my report back. Any thoughts? So just a question. So they don't have any interest in, the, in being the operator for the whole? Yet. Oh, okay. But they, they, they want to get us started, and, yeah. and they very well might. Okay. But they're currently, they're currently building in New Hampshire, so ValleyNet, not EC Fiber, is going out into uh, Lyme, New Hampshire, and building fiber networks there, separate from what EC Fiber is doing. So they are already sort of coloring outside of the EC Fiber lines mm -hmm. as it stands. Yeah, I, I think from the discussion with Stan, he sounded pretty interested in keeping, thing going, keeping things going in Vermont and building out in Vermont and seeing this grant opportunity and, and our situation as, as something that, that you know, he would like to be able to tap into to keep himself and his folks and, and expand what he's doing in, in Vermont. We, it, we didn't know what to expect. I don't think we expected that walking yeah. <laughs> in, in the room. No. No, I mean, so, yeah, there was no agenda given, whatever. We walked in there and they kind of laid that in our lap, kind of just kind of stared at each other for a second. <laughs> um, any other thoughts? What's this more specific on the Vita loan? Like, is it, is it a planning? Is it a build out? Infrastructure. It, it's an infrastructure. It is for building stuff. It's for building stuff. Um, I mean, presumably we could use we could still pick any other operator we wanted to. A lot of this is just convenience and alignment, right? Right. But in order to go to in order to go get a loan like that, you have to come with a, a, so, a build plan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like um, uh, the guy from Fujitsu said, yeah. here's the spectrum of services. You know, yeah. here's the the board level plan, and then there's like the ready for investors plan. And Stan is saying he's going to hand us the ready for the loan plan. Use, essentially using their numbers, expecting that, you know, we're going to use roughly their, their model for uh, the network, using the, the same sort of equipment, um, roughly using their same policies. And that would be something that we would have to adopt, though. I mean, their operational policies, that that's still the way we want to go. He's going to still expect that we're also going to roughly follow the, um, the monthly fee schedule. I think we have some flexibility there to talk about that, just based on... Um, how things go from there. I, I would also add that you know, we, we were kind of taken aback, so we're throwing, throwing questions and probably having the worst poker face possible. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, 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 we're throwing questions, and there, there, there's, there, there's, there's nothing in this that I heard, and we haven't seen anything written, uh, there's nothing where we're, we're giving up any autonomy here. And, and we can make other decisions, we can make concurrent decisions that are different from whatever relationship, re relationship we decide to have with, with ValleyNet. It, 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 I'm really looking forward to seeing what they, what they write up for us because it could be a, a good opportunity to get a leg up. Or we might decide that it, it, for whatever reason ties our hands together too much and we don't want to operate that way. But it, he, gave, he gave a good talk. <coughs> Where were we at with the RFP part? And like, were we required for some level amounts of how much you wanted to go after for money and that requires an RFP? Is that, does this fall into that? Or is that? No, this is, I mean, supposing that we don't get the USDA grants at all, this is still, this is can, it's still, it's still something separate. So, but it, it does tail, dovetails nicely if we think about going, uh, if we do get the USDA grant, if we do do the feasibility study and the business plan, and we hire whomever for that, um, that's going to be a plan for the whole district. You know, we're going to have some immediate build plans for the southern part of the district, it sounds like, but then we can figure out how do we then leverage that to, you know, maybe we want to you know, target some of the feasibility study down there and then the business plan, a... Uh, schedule for how we expand from there or something like that. I'm a little concerned that, uh, well, I, I don't have any concerns. I guess <clears throat> given your first impression with these people, you, what, what impression did you walk away with 
for their motivation of this surprise offer. And I'll get into explaining why I'm asking the question here. <clears throat> Did you think that this was a, a charitable offer on their part? Did you think this was birds of a feather kind of an offer, try to help you out? Or do you think this represents, from their standpoint, if I were sitting on their board of directors, would I try to sell this to the shareholders by saying, here is a low-cost opportunity at incremental business down the road. They're a, they're a nonprofit. It's I mean, and and frankly, we wouldn't be. I, I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for them. Um, the vast majority of the, my knowledge that I have about broadband in Vermont comes from them. So, um, they've also been active in outreach to the legislature uh, and other folks who are interested in building. You know, building broadband networks <clears throat> in Vermont. So um, I think it is a... Uh, so this is an act of friendship. You don't see this as they're viewing it as a business development opportunity. Well, and e even nonprofits have to have a viable business <laughs> model. Sure. The question is, what do you do with the excess money? And that's the only difference. Yeah. Right. Well, and I, I think that's certainly part of it, though. I okay. mean, there's, there's economies of scale, clearly, that are involved. Well, sitting in... Nonprofits and sitting on for profit private sector corporations, more business is good as long as the integration model works between two different entities. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Mm -hmm. As we find out what their proposal looks like, and having lived through a number of mergers and acquisitions, I can tell you that the hard work begins when you try to integrate two different systems. The good news is, is we don't have a system yet <laughs> other than the bylaws that we want. The bad news is that we may not be smart enough to know what a good system is. Right. Um, so I would say it's all three of the things you okay. posed. Um, I'm sure that there is real business interests involved here. Um, and that doesn't bother me, but it's but they Doesn't should, they should be, I, I didn't think it did. Yeah, two de you know, they should put a good deal together, both parties have to have good motivation. Yeah. I'm just looking uh, the mechanics of putting a deal together are simple compared to finding motivated, uh, reliable partners. So they're good people. Yep. They definitely are good people. They definitely are motivated mostly for altruistic reasons. They are, do see in their future where they're going to finally build out all their towns. And then they're going to have to either um, start lowering rates or expanding or something because they're going to have more revenue than they need for their nonprofit, which is what you partly were alluding to. So so there's that. Um, but I have a couple of questions about it that, that we should take back to them. One is um, they aren't done with their build out and their member towns I'm, I'm wondering if their board, with the EC Fiber Board, not Valinet, but the EC Fiber Board, would object to Valinet prioritizing some CD Fiber towns because of this imminent contractor deal over some of their towns not being served first. Is the possibility of that, especially in the light of Carol, have Carol, who's the, the departing CEO of the Oak Valley Net, um, having mentioned that a significant problem for them is that their contractors are not able to keep up with all that they want them to do. So there's sort of a shortage of labor. <coughs> so that would be a concern that we should express and make sure that we won't get short shrift if we do go with them and it won't turn into some kind of political problem in the BC Fiber organization. So that's one thing I want to say. Another thing is, um, if we're going to use, <coughs> excuse me, if we're going to use their same networking, if we're going to use their same hardware, if we're going to use their same system, it will be an easy integration for them to go with us. But then the point we just heard is that that's going to tie us to those systems and those pieces of equipment. And so Yes, we could always go with other organizations for different parts, but it, it gets very inefficient quickly when you have different systems trying to integrate. So that's another thing we have to look at really closely. Um, I had another thing, but David, go ahead. I mean, to me, I, I would like to have us make our own technology advice, get our own technology advice in terms of what we ought to be deploying in the future and not making sure that something that Valleynet and PC5 decided eight years ago was the right solution 
to be stuck with that kind of technology. Well, so I can speak to that. Uh, they switched technology recently, a year or two ago. Um, and I like what they're using. It's expensive. So that's oh. that's the thing we may be concerned with. Um, they, they had stuff that works well, but they switched to something that works better. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not a year old technology that they're stuck with. Um, and it costs I still, them, I, I guess I'd like an independent I agree with you that. on that. So, it co so they, and it costs them a lot of money to switch. Mm -hmm. And so making a wise decision early is really important. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. What is the relationship between EC Fiber and ValleyNet? And will it be the same relationship between our communications union district and ValleyNet? I would expect it would be quite similar. So what is the relationship? I'll, I'll put a specific. When the system seeks financing, who seeks the finance? EC Fiber, or CB Fiber, as the case may be. Right. And EC Fiber owns the infrastructure. Okay. EC Fiber. So you they know, have a contract with ValleyNet to perform operating services. Correct. Okay. And they contract out to a builder to do it. They don't. They don't to really install either. the actual but construction. But the administrative functions of the system is C is ValleyNet. Yeah, billing, tech support. Doing the drops to the individual houses. Doing the drops? They contract out most of the drops, but they do some of them themselves. Okay. As I understand. It, it, that has changed periodically. Uh, uh, these, these are very, very good points. There is a fairly well understood way to get through these knotholes. The first thing we need is some sort of a description of exactly what the relationship will be. And that would include also the technology, the operating guidelines, and stuff like this. Uh, when public corporations merge, uh, there's essentially a ruling model which comes from the Securities and Exchange Commission, which requires what's called system integration teams. We can form our own small team of system integrating people to look at what they've got and compare it with what we want, and then nibble away at any points of friction. But, uh, for instance, major corporate acquisition, senior executives from each pot company, the acquired company and the acquiring company, are put into what's called a white room. And their job is to make sure that everything works in the new company, order administration, customer service, manufacturing, parts, numbers, inventories. And their job ends when the integration is complete. They can no longer remain with the surviving company. So it's a beautiful, beautiful model that prevents conflict of interest, but the techniques and the approaches are well known, well understood. We can, we can embrace all of the concerns that are, that are surfacing right now by having a good systems integration team. And, and I think some of that can come, can come out of our process when we get the plan from ValleyNet and we are, we are hiring our consultant to do the feasibility study and business plan exactly. and so we can have we can have that outside person that will you know, we'll scratch that itch that David identified and making sure that we're making the technology choices and the system choices that we want and then how, how does that then mesh with what ValleyNet's doing in parallel with their uh, in parallel with their anticipated documents we made we may want to begin considering writing down what some of our goals and objectives are in the proposed merger so that the integration team has some guidance. That makes sense. So it's like a merger, but it isn't a merger. So we have to get <laughs> it, I, I'm just saying use the model because yeah. it works. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing about the model is that the two companies merging have systems to integrate. We don't. And we well, have we have different board members with different ideas and we but don't the nature have of the previous conversations were how do we get what we look for I want my own technology right. these are all valid concerns sure. we just have to surface them in a disciplined fashion mm -hmm. Jerry, so a quick question how does the document they're putting together relate to the business plan the feasibility study that we are putting well I expect it's going to be um, if we accept it if that's something that something that we want to go forward with that will um, integrate in some way to, to what's going going forward. I mean, if we decide to just, um, if we decide to do a lighter touch with, with what these guys are talking about and just simply to accept what they offer and move forward, then the, the, they're going to start you know, doing paperwork and operations and
helping us get a loan and then building. And then um, that will be, you know, that might be a phase one of a larger picture, the larger business plan, the larger um, kind of strategic goals. I would think we could take that plan and hand it to the consultants that yes. we're hiring and say, what do you think of this? We kind of like it, but we're not the experts and you're more of an expert. What do you think of this? Yeah. If you like it, integrate it into what you were going to do. Yeah. If you don't, pick it apart and tell us which parts are strong and which aren't. And I, it, it, it'd be a wonderful opportunity to have extra extra work already done, and it might lower the cost of our study as well. Sure. Uh, they still have plenty of work to do, but did you get a sense in the room of how fast they're thinking that would get rolled out to the point of like actually having customers coming online? And the, um, the So it's all, I mean, this particular plan was contingent on the Vita loan being coming into existence. It's, it was passed in the House. It's in the Senate. I don't, I expect it would land in Senate finance. Has it been assigned? Okay. So assuming it gets passed, and I think all signs are pointing to that it will, um, I think, what did, what did he say? He said he was looking at like application in January of 2020 for the loan. And the year to something, something getting service. Yeah. So, so, he, so I think he was looking at the end of 2020. I was hoping it'd be sooner than that. Not and, for and them, but for the, the law, for the loan being available. Well, and, and it very well might be. I, I think he was being, I don't think Vita won't. I think Vita will need six months. Just to, to learn the this the Yeah, to, to feel comfortable starting yeah. to accept the application. <clears throat> cool. Anything else on this uh, Valley Net thing? Um, so we will, I'm sure we will be coming back to that in some form or another. Uh, next one, Northern Borders grant application. So uh, we talked about the Northern Borders Regional Commission um, with the most recent farm bill um, now covers all of the state of Vermont. So that means that even down here in central Vermont we can take advantage of um, these grants that were previously only available to folks up in the kingdom. Um, we put in a letter of intent to apply for this as CV Fiber. Thank you for that. I appreciate that, David. He, he wrote it. I signed it. It was great. Um, there's another opportunity for a partnership, though, and I want to just read you a little bit of what uh, um, um, what's in mind. So I, there was a phone call that was um, spearheaded by Ben Doyle at uh, USDA again. Um, with a whole bunch of folks who are looking at building out broadband in Vermont. And the idea that was pitched there and that was um, um, generally got a lot of support was the idea of why not everybody that's doing what we're trying to do, and that's, you know, is at various parts of planning, why doesn't everybody all go in on one big um, Northern Borders grant? So that's including folks up in the kingdom, that's including folks in Newbury. Uh, you were on that mailing list, Michael. I, you weren't on the call, as I recall. No, I didn't, um, I didn't get the mail. I didn't get the email, sorry. MB I at got, capefiber.net was Ben Doyle's. I got the, I got the after oh. meeting email. Yeah, that's what I got there. I got the after meeting. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know what was happening. Oh, that's okay. Like, I just expected I called them right after that. So, okay. Hey, Brad, you know. So, um, yeah, there's another group that's looking at creating a um, <coughs> communications union district um, also up in the kingdom. I'm trying to remember where he was. Anyways, I can I can look back through my notes. There's a guy in Linden. Yeah. Lindenville, yes. Yeah, and then there's also NVDA is sort of in the north. north whatever north the economic Eastern, development. Yeah. The, the collaborative, whatever they call it. Any type of collaborative. Yeah. Those people. Yeah, Catherine. Yeah. Um, Yes, so the idea here was that, and, and they, have, they have also submitted a letter of intent. Who is spearheading this? Um, Catherine, that's right. NVDA. Well, yeah, David Snedek is the lead on it. Yeah, so NVDA, which is Northern Vermont Development, Development Association? Corp Development Corporation. Development Corporation, okay. NVDA, oh, association. Oh, no. association. Association. Yeah. Huh? So, association. So they have submitted an, an, a letter of intent uh, it says, and we'll take the lead on putting together an application in cooperation with other entities, including those outside of NVDA service area. 
If you're interested in pursuing this collaborative opportunity, which is why it's on our agenda right now, and believe that your community or initiative could benefit from the project, please contact Dave Snedeker, the executive director. Um, and uh, the things that the Northern Borders Grant could do, and there's a bullet, bulleted list I'll just briefly read, could provide technical assistance to communities and help them organize or stand up CUDs. Well, we got that done already. Facilitate local conversations, capacity building for communities interested in expanding broadband and access, and that would be outside of the CUD structure. Position communities and CUDs for additional planning and implement, implementation funding, whether through NBRC, USDA, and so on and so on. Um, Essentially, uh, one of the things that they talked about on the call was essentially having someone, um, having a position funded who would, could essentially spearhead some of these efforts statewide, which I realize is somewhat redundant with what the, that was in the, legis what the, the legislature legislation. was looking yeah. to fund in <clears throat> the Department of Public Service as a yeah. broadband, community broadband specialist, or I don't remember what, what they called it. Um, so you called Ben after this. Did you get any sort of different, any different read from what he said other than that? No, but I can't speak to the person they want to hire. It's a slightly different role than what the department would have. Mm -hmm. The department person would be eventually an expert who could help communities do stuff and be a liaison with the state government. And what they want to do in the NEK, and now they're talking about possibly statewide, is have somebody who's um, a clearinghouse and advocate. I mean, they're, the two roles cross, but they're not the same. Mm -hmm. And it's good to have something out of government as well as in, from my experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't, I think it's a good idea. Um, so I don't know if going into this collaborative uh, application would prevent us from sending our own application in, or if we you know, still want to do that. Um, but I, again, I put it out there. We can make a choice. Do you, does anybody know whether doing one precludes the other? I review the grants. Okay. So you have to not preclude. Okay. So, so, so we could do both conceivably. Sure. Okay. Yeah, my, my understanding right now is it's about a four or five to one ratio of of requests to the funds. So just to keep that you know, sort of level of competition. Okay. And there's no S in border. It's, uh, it's northern it's border. Northern border. Is it? Yeah. Oh. I kept correcting northern border to northern borders. Yeah. So okay. if either one of these these are would these be planning funds at this point? I don't think so. Uh, so if, I think for the, the one with the, the NVDA group that it would um, on a we put out some more implementation. But yeah, so we were looking for actual construction funds. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so there's more value to match something where there's infrastructure. To match sort of the NVDA invested, the, the VITA money. And okay. So should we tell Hi, them? This, this is uh, Jonathan. I'm it, just curious. I know that there's a $250,000 cap uh, and a $500,000 cap. I'm just curious as to uh, if we fall under the uh, $500,000 cap for a grant application for Northern Water Regional Commission. 250. So mm -hmm. Ken, Ken Jones just said it's 250. And, and, oh, okay. And Thank this you. this collaborative thing is talking about not a construction grant. It's not an infrastructure it's a plan, grant. It's a support. Yeah. It's a support, support system yeah. for like next year, going for the infrastructure grant. <laughs> So shall we tell them yes, that we're interested? One more question? Yeah. Ken, what's the dollar cap on if it were a construction grant? That's not still 250,000. Yeah. yeah. Well, that is it. Yeah, oh. 250 is it, unless, yeah, the, the cooperative grants would, you'd have to have two pretty separate entities working together, I think even ideally across multiple states. That's the gets you to 500, and then 500 is it. Okay. By the way, there's a census block in Barry. There's a disadvantaged census block. All right. <laughs> so if you want, in terms of saying you get employees and grow a business, you'd have to locate the office of this one census block in Barry. Mm -hmm. Is there office space in that census block? I don't know. No, no, <laughs> it's probably downtown. It's on this side of uh, Main Street. 
so okay. it's sort of weird. You know, the Barry City Development Corporation would be helpful in, in that regard. And, and all of them well counted. So two years ago, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Town of Craftsburg applied for an NBRC grant, asked for 250, worked with the staff at, at the commission. They thought 250 was the right number. It ended up we got 231. <laughs> Well, wow. yep, that's pretty good. We didn't have enough money. I know. <laughs> so we went to the state and we got the difference. So that worked. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Jonathan again. Sorry to keep interrupting. I'm looking at the application manual right now, and I am familiar with this grant opportunity for uh, my job. But um, it seems like that for fiscal year 2019, there is a $500,000 cap for infrastructure projects, and that does include telecommunications projects. Um, as defined under a site federal statute, but um, so I I don't know if I think there is actually probably thousand dollars available. I'll I'll double check that. Okay. So, shall we try to do both? I mean, the letter of intent is in for both already. That that deadline's passed. Shall I tell the folks? There. I guess, how would we use that service? Uh, we would have something like a part-time staff person that could help with other grants and uh, well, uh, other grants and other sort of organizational capacity. Yeah. Yeah. And and we, I mean, but we could also, we could also take what our requirements are, and present that to them. And, and say that this is something that we're interested in. Manage our website. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, were, were you looped in on that, Barry? What's that? Were you looped in on this no, uh, northern border? I, I like Michael got the the, uh, the, the post after the fact. Okay, so this you know could this help from your perspective? You you guys, where you would have a, a, like a collaborative staff or outside your organization, such that you could. Um, use them for stuff that you can't task your own staff with? Well, um, I don't know if you want me it's appropriate I can address it now. We, we applied, we're applying for a northern border oh. uh, directly, but it's for a feasibility study and business plan for our whole territory, 41 counties. Um, and as part of that grant, we would probably be working in part with maybe Carol alone to help us with the consulting and depending on who you guys ended up with with consultants because we have a broader perspective but if we uh, a broader territory and, and a, a different a little bit I'd say broader integration that we have to deal with um, if we ended up with the same consultants it would probably overlap and lower our costs and I think that's that's a potential feasibility. I, at at this point, um, from going to the northern border um, session they had, it doesn't look like technically this money will not be available until like uh, for spending like until October, unless you get a special waiver on it. And the earliest it would be available would be sometime in August. So I don't know how that's going to overlap with. I don't know where you are in terms of the uh, rural development grant or when they said they're going to either notify you or um, when the money would be available. That's kind of where we're, we're yeah, at this point. That, that I don't know exactly. Do you know the timeline in that offhand? No. I, mean, I mean, technically our application is, is not uh, fully submitted yet. We, I still have physical papers to hand to them. Once that gets to them, then our application begins, and that's something we'll talk about more in a bit. Um. I've done a little bit of chasing the grants. It's uh, mildly amusing and a lot of fun to do. Just uh, <coughs> what I'd like to do is part of the grant chasing, uh, making ourselves as pretty as we can to get the money. I'd also like to see us do a reasonable job of due diligence of finding out what the continuing requirements are of meeting and fulfilling the grant. An example is I got grants from the EPA and from the uh, State Drinking Water Fund and a bunch of other stuff to build a public drinking water system. Mm -hmm. And the recurring requirements, both administratively, financially, and 
from a quality standpoint of both dealing with DEC and with EPA are a cost, an ongoing cost. So let's go in with our eyes open, grab all the money we can get, but make sure we're capable of complying with the follow-up requirements that every grant comes with. So if you're going to take USDA in one hand and NBRC in the other, difficulty, USDA compared to our NBRC. NBRC is a lot easier to comply with. They're still diligent, mm -hmm. but they don't have quite as much bureaucracy and, and they're easier to work with. Yeah, that's good news. Yeah, <laughs> it's very good news. And, and you're not dealing with Vermont's DEC. What's DEC? That's the Department of Environmental. Uh, which runs water, and they're scared because the EPA told them that Vermont's going to lose all of its federal funding if it doesn't hurry up and clean up Lake Champlain, so <laughs> they're not fun to deal with. So, not hearing any sort of like outpouring of anger, I think I will, um, I will, I will read the room and say that we're going to go forward with both of them, with the, uh, the grant application that um, David, um, so kindly wrote the letter of intent for what? What was the amount of, of that that you? I thought it was five hundred thousand, but. <laughs> well, they, so they, they they didn't shout at us when we. Um, so that was for an infrastructure grant. Yeah. Where did I put that? That was bold. Yeah. Plus, it's in the letter of intent. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good intent. There is a there is a one one match. What's the what, what's the match? One to one. one. I'm sorry. One to one. That might present some challenges. All right, let's see. How are we doing on that 12.5? How are those donations? Right? Somebody have that routing number from your bank account, Michael. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. drive next week. Yeah, so, yeah, you, you did say uh, 500000 and the idea was, yeah, to use this to, for construction. Yes, yeah. Well, we can turn it into an application. Not well, sure, sure, yeah. but but I, I think you know, um, combining this with the um, with, with the Vita loan, if that's possible. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Something like that. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, and that could be. That could be. Doable. I would just. Uh, this is John again. Again, I would just add that all work uh, that would be funded through this specific grant opportunity would have to be completed by 2022. Yeah. I think we can. Yeah. I think we can spend money that fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to take by silent consensus that we'll move forward with with both of these. Um, I will contact the folks um, that put in the other uh, letter of intent, and we'll and we'll go from there. Awesome. All right. I would suggest that. We're probably adding more to their application than we're going to get out of it, but we'll still get something out of it. There's no reason not to cooperate. Sure, and, and they, I mean, they specifically invited us to be a part of it as well. So, um, if it's not too, uh, if it's not too forward, are you intending on, on joining the kind of larger consortium? I don't have the intent, but I'm considering it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Next up, we've got Washington Electric Co-op. Welcome again, Barry. Thank you. Um, you. You already stole my show. I don't know if I have anything else to say. Um, <laughs> we're, you know, uh, we decided not to go ahead with the rural development because of the March 29th deadline, which is for application. So um, the northern borders actually made more sense to us because it gave us more time. Um, I, I would say we're not quite as nimble in terms of we have to really think some things through in order to take a look at what we're doing, but we did put in a letter of intent. Uh, we're basically asking for a $90,000 grant to do a feasibility study and a uh, business plan for um, the 41 towns in, in WEC. And um, let me just say, when I said I didn't know about the <coughs> other one, um, you know, we're we're really unsure exactly what our role is going to be and what role we'll take on, and um, so we're always keeping in mind a collaboration process with you and other folks. I mean, we're our goal is to get this to happen for our members if we can, um, without going up too far out on a limb where 
um, we outstretch what our capability is to deliver our electric services. So I've really been, we've, a lot's happened for us just in our moving on this in the last four months. Because we've talked with Michael and David and Carol and we met with Magellan folks and um, we're just trying to process all of it. Uh, so we're not locked into anything in terms of in or out. Our, my, my individual, and I think the board will support this, is to try to help you guys and us and however we can do that. We're just going to try to keep as open as we can as, as we look, look at it. Um, we're looking at um, what we can, I mean, the things we have to evaluate is what fiber does for our own business infrastructure, for the co-op infrastructure, which if we can get some of that done, either through grants or whatever, that's going to help lower the cost of the hookup to the house. The discussion we had when we first started taking a look at this in November, December, just a discussion was um, we're concerned about um, EC Fiber's number that they use is $75 to be able to hook up for many of our members who are elders and low income in Orange and some in Washington and, you know, Caledonia. So, county, so that's, you know, uh, in my opinion, I think uh, to make this successful, we got to be able to pull down some grants. Um, obviously, with any of these, the more collaboration we do, the better we're going to be in applying for grants because that's what they're looking for. Um, Velco has been, we've been in discussions with Velco about hooking up our substations with fiber from theirs to our substations to our main office. To me, that would be a really big thing because it's just going to help us tie into that structure. It's going to help you tie into us. And um, and we do have the unique advantage of, and what Carol and Michael have, have pointed out, is we own our own poles. So um, we just have to get clear on it, the, the added task that we're taking on and how to best do that. So, you know, I'm pretty excited about it, as Steve Noteboot came out, he was on the phone the other day, and as I've said to Jeremy and Michael and David and all of you, I'm really appreciative of you guys pushing this, because I think that's got us to uh, get into it, and we'll just have to see where we can go, because I think the real, again, this is an opinion based on not a lot of experience, but I think that if we could pull down one of those federal grants, um, you know, that has $200 million, but some number um, that we could all do that would would really help bring down that cost, which I think is critical. Um, a lot of co-ops, I think I mentioned um, that I'm the Vermont Delegate Director on the National Rural Electrification Cooperative Association, and I'm the Business and Technology Committee. And so I'm looking and gathering information on a lot of co-ops that are doing this across the country in different modes. Some are just doing the backbone. Some are bringing services all the way to the end user. Um, the, the question, I think, in my mind and concern is this whole thing about the uh, consensus blocks. And there is something in the legislation, I think, coming forward federally. Michael, you may be able to address this at by 2020, they're asked if the legis legislation passes, they're going to ask for the F is it the Federal Trade Commission to review the information they're using? Have you seen? I just saw something on that recently come through. No, I'm not aware of what you're. Yeah, so it's kind of addressing this thing about, like uh, Magellan was saying, about us going after a waiver on, on, on these things. So that was a USDA waiver we were talking about. On the, on the, the contaminated census block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure what it was, but, but basically there's a push to get get them to use different information. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seemed to me, from when I read it, that it was in line with, maybe it's not, but. Um, well, one of the, I mean, I, the Public Service Department's pretty aware of this one. Mm -hmm. um, the census blocks, particularly Callis and Plainfield, which was supposed to be served by VTEL, mm -hmm. never got those towers. So technically, even though VTEL got funded, to serve that area, it never gets served. So somehow it does have to be cleaned up you know, at some point. Yeah, so 
I think that's that's going to the challenge for all of us is going to be finding the areas that we can make most successful, eat soonest, so that we can demonstrate that this can work at a rate that's reasonable for for people. And I guess that's one of the things the feasibility study that we'll both end up probably doing. Hopefully, we'll both have the funds to do it. We can collaborate on that. Will tell us what that take rate is, or you're saying take rate isn't that important, but obviously the territory you have that's well, clean is important. important. It's important. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just um, high take rate isn't as important as people think. Okay. It's, it's achievable with a lower take rate. Yeah. I know I, I happen to be at uh, a meeting in uh, Orlando, our national meeting, and just happened to have a a lunch, uh, open bag lunch with somebody sitting next to me. He was from Missouri, and they uh, did a whole plan. They're, they're 35,000 members, but uh, they they were feeling they could build out in six or seven years with three to five, three and a half, I think, or 3.9, and make it work. And it was at less of a number than we are, but they had more people. But it was close, less miles. Yeah. Uh, no, they actually have a bigger territory to have 35,000 spread over, and it's pretty rural, so. So, do you, do you have a sense that because you own the poles and you have line workers, that this whole $30,000 a mile figure for string and fiber, is that something you can take a bite out of? You can well, reduce your costs? Well, let, let, me, let me say, all I can repeat is what I've heard from Carol and, <laughs> and Michael, is that, yes, I, I I've, the last conversation I had with Carol um, was that we might be able to get that down to 22,000. And one of the things that I think we'll have to explore, and let me just be very clear with you, this is January, February, yeah. March, three months of uh, that I know so much more than I did four months ago, and that's very little. And I rely on some of the people here. but. Um, one of the things, even though it's more expensive, that if we run in the electrical space, it's going to save us money. It's going to save all of us money. Whatever we can do to bring that number down is going to yeah, make it Explain that to me. What, 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 where are you on? The yeah, where are you on the public? Why is that cheaper? Michael, you probably know more of the answer on this, but I've been mm -hmm. told that it's... Yeah, go ahead. I mean, so so if, if we run the fiber cable in the communication space. It's just like Comcast and Consolidated and every other communications carrier. We pay for a license either quarterly, twice a year or once a year to the pole owner. But they're the pole owner. Right. But it's regulated. But if it's in the communication space, we have to do that. Even if they are paying themselves. Okay. So it would be part of the cost. That's okay. one thing. Okay. Um, another is that if, if you're applying for an attachment license in the communication space, and by attaching, taking your 12-inch space on the pole, um, the phone company's line always is at the bottom. Cool. And if the phone company, that's just a oh, I see that. That's so we are going to move on the line. So no. all of them. So if Everything has to get lowered if there's no space. And then the question is, oh, does the lower one cross the road high enough? Oops, it doesn't. Now you need a new pole. Yeah. So that's if you're up in the electric space, there is no so-called make ready because all poles are already there and there's already space available. So there's the make ready cost alone is a huge part of the thirty thousand. So I remember that the cost to because well we presently have thirty five or forty foot poles, some forty five. The cost to replace each pole is like four or five thousand yeah. dollars. We have twenty thousand poles, so if we can, <laughs> if we can, if we can avoid that, yeah. think it, and like I said, I got all these bits and pieces. Of fire. If we can avoid that, we avoid that cost, which passes all the way down the line for everybody. That's that's information. Let me add two more things to yeah. the question about the thirty thousand. Um, EC Fiber quotes 30,000, including five drops per mile. They, they, they don't just want to get five drops per mile. They include the cost of those five drops in their 30,000. No one else figures it that way. Everyone else says, what's it cost to run per mile plus drops? And then you figure out the drop separately. 
Each drops cars. separately, Michael. Excuse me? Each drops separately, yeah. the cost per drop. Yeah, and, and so <clears throat> our application to NBRC and USDA at, for Crestbury was based on 23,000 a mile. Mm -hmm. And we, we kept to the budget. Um, some things were higher than expected, some things were lower, it worked out. Um, it varies, prices are going up, different, different, um, different utilities charge different amounts, some places you can get away with hardly any make ready, and the other places you have to replace a quarter of the poles. So it's hard to predict for sure. So I think maybe 25 is a good number to assume as an average. And that's before you take these savings of going in the electric space. And the last thing, I, I don't mean to no, no, monopolize, we, but the we, last we thing that's important is that if we are in the electric space, there are some added costs. The, the line workers have to know what they're doing. Three things. <laughs> One, you have to have qualified line workers. They have to be utility qualified line workers all the time, every time you're touching, touching the fiber. Um, two, the way around that is to drop a splice case in the communications space wherever you're going to drop to houses. Well, now we have to pay pole rent for those spots and we might generate make ready for those particular poles. It's still a whole lot less poles than before, but that's an added cost. And three, to be in the electric space, you can't use the conventional steel strand overlashed with fiber because steel is a conductor and it's not allowed in the electric space. So you have to use ADSS, which is all dielectric self-supporting cable. And that costs more. And the attaching hardware for each pole costs more. So there's trade-offs. But it's still it's still an advantage. But it's not it's not a pure advantage. Michael, did you did did you feel from what you know that it's um, that you would tend to want to go there so you could avoid the pole? I mean replacing poles. I mean, that's to me the big price advantage. It depends on how much your other costs are. So as an operator, I would rather be in the communication space because we can use different contractors and we can use, and, and our budget would be lower for the construction costs. But as a representative for the CUD, looking at how, the immensity of what we want to do and how much money that is, the, the opportunity to save 10% per mile is pretty big, and I think I would lean that way. So I, I would hate to deal with this ADSS stuff. It's not as good to work with, and, and I would hate to have to always get this other contractor to go up there and pay them extra to do it. And, but I think that the savings outweigh those irritations. So that's the thing you in our feasibility study. We want to weigh in order to have somebody actually cost it out to see what yeah. What the numbers are. And, and is there any, I guess the material is a reason never to do a hybrid. Like in some places we get long stretches or something you don't need, you know, you go in the electric space, or I, I don't know, but just yeah, places. Yeah, you probably wouldn't want to switch fiber, yeah, but you, right. could, you could go up and down and up and down. I mean, yeah. you're going to go, on, when we go on the Green Mountain Power we're gonna have poles, to we're not, not going to necessarily let us in their electric space, so we may have to right. dip down. Right. Right. Bob, you have something? I just uh, got a little scared here, so tell me I don't have to get scared. When I look at uh, all be the discussion that we're having, oh, be fearful, uh, I didn't say the discussion fearful. that we're currently having, uh, which is basically what I would call uh, the installation cost issue. I would like us also to please be mindful of what I call TCO, total cost of ownership. It may be more expensive to put it in, but is it cheaper in the long run to put it in one way where it's just the other? So let's look at installation cost, but that is a subset of total cost of ownership. Mm -hmm. And we found in a lot of businesses that I've managed to muddy uh, that TCO was the more important determinant for long-term viability of being in the business. So let's just look at both. Mm -hmm. There's build cost and TCO cost. The other question, and you touched on it in my mind, with the difference in materials uh, required in terms of the wires and the structural, has anybody made sure that the structural impact on the poles is not adversely affected by one, either the location up or down, or by the weight 
that's being born there. Yeah. And as a pilot, I'm very, very sensitive to nice. wind loads and other stuff. It's not only the vertical load, but it's also the wind load. Right. Just, let's just be sure that we're not introducing a variable in an adverse weather condition that would cause increased maintenance and repair costs. It's, can I speak to that? It's not an issue because number one, these cables are very thin. They don't, they certainly have a load when there's ice on them and so right. forth, but, but compared to a telephone cable with lots of copper pairs in it or a coaxial cable, sure. TV cable, it, they're so tiny. Yeah, from an ice standpoint, and, it's and, a surface area phenomenon. Right, and, and, <clears throat> and, and the weight of them is so, they're so light. Bingo. So secondly, even though they are so light, the utilities require that every time the pole line turns, or every time it terminates, there has to be a counter-acting guy into an anchor, even if it's the super light fiber. We had to put them in all over the place. So the structurally, it's engineered, and it's not, I've never heard it being an issue. But uh, the, the structural counter uh, force, however you put it in there, is the same whether it's in the communication space or the electrical space. Yeah, because you'll see that the power company puts guys up higher for this. You put the guy right opposite of your attachment, so the the angle changes. But Fine. they have much heavier cables than than the fiber is. The, the the power company does. Would there be a greater frequency of outages being up in the electrical space? Thinking of like branches coming down and possibly taking out the top end stuff, the bottom stuff stays. In I have no idea. That's a good question. Maybe we could get a grant to study. <laughs> <laughs> we could just throw some branches up and see what happens. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I'm going to say that for the moment, at least structural considerations, we can table. It, it's a non-factor. The cost point. of ownership is is very important. And that's going to, I think, that's going to come out in part of Barry and Weck's uh, feasibility study. And I expect that we will also have, in our feasibility study, we will also have a bit of that. Um, calculus in our in our study as well so that knowing knowing what our choices are and being able to make wise um, fully informed choices that I'm yeah, sure that no, would be I'm just concerned that TCO has been my battle cry for years because that's the thing that a lot of people overlook and it bites the heck out of them down the road sure. I you know I, just one thing that's up, that's been on my mind obviously not just around this but we've been hit with more major storms every year we had five major storms 2018, 4, and 2017, uh, which puts a lot of stress on systems. So we we definitely, when we're looking about communication space versus electrical, want to also you know, take a look at that impact question because it's, it's an important one. We are going to be ramping up our right-of-way clearing over the next several years pretty intensely. And we're also going to be taking out a lot of ash trees that you know, but we're going, we'll take, we've had a danger tree removal tree program to take trees 100, up to 100 feet out, out of the way, because that's a lot of what's coming down, but we're going to have to get a lot more aggressive, which I think will interplay with what's going on here. Okay. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, I didn't want to get in the weeds here, but uh, I was just curious about the ADSS versus the steel wrap cable, and if there's a tensile strength difference between those two. So that kind of ties in with the storm idea. Um, the, the steel strand supported is um, tensioned more. You get less sag. Um, the ADSS is engineered to handle that stress. Um, it's got the strength member in, in the middle of the fiber. Um, but I haven't heard of it being an issue. It's, it's harder to work with for a, for a splicer than this conventional fiber. But the manage. I, I seem to remember EC Fiber reporting that the, the steel strand supported communication space uh, fiber that they run. They said they've they've had times where there have been branches come down that's held up by the fiber. <coughs> and so it's quite there is an issue of maintenance. When ADSS does break, let's say a truck hits a pole and breaks the pole, that happens all over the place frequently, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, That'll take out fiber, uh, whether it's on a steel strand or not. Um, but 
the repair is just involves splicing in some more fiber. When it's ADSS, you usually have to go back a span in each direction to splice it. It's just more, it's for the strength purpose. And so that's that's a hassle. Okay, anything else, any questions for Barry? Any other thoughts about um, potential future relationships with WEC or anything? Yeah, I have a question for you, Barry. Yeah. Um, uh, I have two questions. First, this is the easy I'm not number. buying your beer tonight, so. <laughs> okay. Why the, the House committee actually added to their bill um, feasibility business plan money for electric co ops, and they added it right after you testified <laughs> to them? So well, I why, is it, why is it why why is it you've decided to go for NBRC instead of that one? Well, <coughs> two things. One is one is sooner. One hasn't passed, and two when I when I when I mentioned that and we at present that money won't be available until after. Uh, at, at present, I don't know where it's, what's going to happen to the finance, Senate Finance Committee because I've raised this issue. It was only going to be available after the DPS finished their report, which oh. wasn't going to happen until December or January. Okay, so, yeah. you know, it's all a moving target. Mm -hmm. What we would probably look at if that passes, and I talked to Ann Cummings, if they will, and we, we met with also uh, Commissioner Kearney, if they will allow that money to happen sooner, we will go after it for our match, because we have to come up with a 35% match of the 65. It gets hard for us because um, we're not allowed to cross subsidize at this point, even though, and that state statute, they're also working on removing that, mm -hmm. and that goes back to 1999 when the gas and oil distributors didn't want the co-ops to have an unfair advantage when we were looking at getting into that. So that's, it's all moving pieces. I okay. mean, it's like I said, um, our board didn't want to go ahead with the, and our manager with the RD one, because it's, we were in the middle of, middle of completing our audits, and the next thing we have is our rate design, so we're just trying to keep the flow moving. Okay, here's my tougher question. Sure. It's not that tough. Okay. Um, the offer, the potential offer from ValleyNet would jumpstart CV Fiber potentially before WEC is ready to partner with CV Fiber. We don't know that you ever will, but you might. And well, I think it's a pretty, pretty open. I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to be cut out of right. working with anybody, for and, sure. And, and it's in our interest to not wait for you. It's in our interest to proceed. Sure, sure. But hope to hope to partner with you. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that ValleyNet doing three towns in the south tied into their system has any potential for making it more difficult to integrate with your 41 towns? No. Here or not? No. I mean, to be honest, ValleyNet may be an option that we would all look at together. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the advantage of us <coughs> for our system is we have ownership over it. The disadvantage is another thing to add to a system that we, that's already taken care of the electrical. So the Valley Net model is one model I think we all all should look at. Uh, I think the questions have been asked about what the relationship is and where, how, it's, how they're going to deal with all of this if they're already too busy are important questions to ask, but I think that kind of third party structure is something we should be asked looking at very closely, whether it's ValleyNet or whether we'd set up an independent one that would do something. Because we have to, we will have to segregate any fiber business we have from the electrical business, even if the statute says <coughs> out of fairness to our electric members. So those are the, I mean, <laughs> All these questions are great because it's just we we all need all the help we can. That's why I said I don't we don't have to be fearful, but we definitely have to be cautious. Um, 
and it's great that Michael's already done work and Carol's done work and you know it's not like we're just jumping in here totally okay guys what do you want to do this week <laughs> yeah. so that's helpful that was last year's meeting yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah very yeah. much so yeah. um, I should okay. point out in terms of the legislation it looks like it's on the agenda for Senate Finance on Friday at 1 30 so if I, I'm not going to be able to make it but uh, if uh, anybody would be willing to go and uh, represent this Friday, this Friday, 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 April 12, 2019, 1:30, Senate Finance, right in the first floor. That's April what? April 12th. 12th. Okay. So anybody? I can't do it. Takers. I wish I could. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll try to go to that. Okay. Uh, and at what points are you guys thinking that you would let? Because. Uh, when I talked to Senator Cummings, she was very supportive of all of this. And as I said, I think the department hopefully will move that, uh, you know, money for, for the co-op so we could use that. But are there other things, Michael, or any of you, I, Jeremy? I think you should direct that question to Kim. Are there any ACCD changes being proposed? No. No. No, ACDs, it's ACCD is always very comfortable with the way it is. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I think generally we are have been comfortable with, with the way it's turned out. So, I mean, yeah. you could probably, you could safely communicate that what we're seeing, we're liking. I expect that um, um, somebody from EC Fiber Valley Net and so on will probably be there. there it's, so it's just, a, I think it's just a walkthrough with Legislative Council by the way it's looked, looking here, but there is somebody. There is somebody who's not, you know, joint fiscal or legislative council, that's scheduled to testify. So, but they only got an, an hour allotted to it, so they might have more on this next week. Yeah, because when we, we did, we were asked as the co-op to come in, and we, we pitched why this was so important for the mm -hmm. territory. And the questions we got were all very really supportive. Were you at any? Were you at any of the, they, they were. They were just supportive. I think they it was, all. It was really great. Yeah, yeah. But in both houses. Mm -hmm. I can go next week. It's yeah. Still there. Yeah. No, I, I, I suspect it's not going to pass out. I mean, I, I think they're going to do a walkthrough and get it, you know, fresh in everybody's mind. Because okay. um, they, they did do, um, they, they did talk to us, before, I think, yeah, even before sure. House Energy and Tech right. touched this, they were, they were talking about this um, much more generally when it was still like six, seven bills. So. I, I was. I just say this. I was really impressed at having been at the legislature for almost 50 years in different capacities. I was really uh, happy to see the margin that passed the House. I mean, I don't know other than resolutions you get anything that's uh, you know a bad number. It was. There were two people who voted against it. I think think it wasn't that they were negative against it. I, I think they wanted something more. It was, yeah, it was, a, it was yeah, de details. Yeah. I think the BTA passed that way, too. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Okay. I, I, moving I along. To, I just want to say I'm really grateful for the work we're doing. So. Well, we're grateful for the work you're doing. So how's that? <laughs> yeah. No, this, this thing would not be happening with a lot, without a lot of people really putting their, their thing in that. Uh, we're, ju we're just going to need hand-holding to figure out what we're all doing together. That's all. So we're, the, we're, we're going to be there. Hopefully. <laughs> Sounds great. All right, next one. Uh, May 23rd, um, Connectivity Breakfast. Uh, I was invited um, to go down to, it's, it's in Dover again, I think, um, this Southern Vermont Economic Development Initiative about you know, looking at broadband statewide. Uh, it's organized by, um, I, think it's like, I don't think it's technically organized by her, but um, Laura Sibilia, who is on House Energy and Tech, um, She's uh, one of the people spearheading economic development, particularly through broadband in southern Vermont. Um, we were asked to send somebody to represent CV Fiber. Um, I can't go because I will be overseas. Anybody interested in going? If you'd like to know where you're going, we'll come with you for that. <laughs> I'm going from Berlin to Berlin. It's all very right. confusing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sister cities. Yeah. yeah. They said the 23rd. 23rd. You're taking one of those new Spirit Air flights out of uh, Berlin? 
No, I was, although, although f f funny you mentioned that, I was actually booked on Wow Air, and then a couple of weeks back, I said, sure that's an upgrade. Well, <laughs> oh, but, 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 but wow, sa wow said a, a week ago last Thursday, they said, we're not flying anymore, bye. Yeah. yeah. Oops. So, oh, well. Well, at least you weren't in the plane when they see us. Yeah, yeah, th <laughs> thankfully. So I had to re rebook mine and all my students' flights, which was, which was amazing. Oh, yeah. But, resolved. Um, <laughs> Takers, I mean, if, what's that? I'm out of town. Out of town, okay. So consider, uh, put it in your schedule, May 23rd. Um, there's a lot of folks working towards similar similar goals down in southern, southern Vermont. If you are so inclined or you know somebody who is, have at it. I mean, let me know. Okay. Um, USDA Rural Development Planning Grant. Jerry, you want to uh, give us a Sure. It's in. You? <laughs> so that's 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 a good step. We have. Uh, <clears throat> I did speak with Susie Poland today, and she sent me Hold some go-bys on that last form. The, the the budget breakdown thing. Yeah, okay. you know, it has all this federal jargon. It looks to me like federal jargon. I just didn't know what the column headings meant. Mm -hmm. um, and she sent me some go-bys. I didn't have a chance to look at them yet, but I ought to be able to turn that around. And uh, we can get that hand, you know, the hard copy package to them. Yeah, and I'll be I'll be handling that Thursday or Friday. Um, but yeah, they they reviewed our application and there, there was nothing outstanding other than the standard hard copy stuff that they that they need that they give you two more weeks to to provide. So, you know, thanks to everybody for all your help for all the different things that we needed. I mean, we got. We've got the five letters of support. We got the two letters of commitment for 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 jobs. Uh, that that to me that was uh, that was really impressive that we got that together so quickly from folks. Uh, yeah, Ken, and thanks to the folks uh, putting in kind services into that. So yeah, this 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 will be really good, regardless of the specifics of what we do with this money. The real you know nitty-gritty specifics of what we do with this money. We need whatever information we can get out of, the, out of this, these funds. We, we really do. Uh, we, we, we need somebody that's not a volunteer spending you know, time and effort on this. We're, we're, we're doing about as much as volunteers can possibly do. So we need somebody on the payroll that's, at, that's actually working on stuff. And there's a step towards it. So I don't know exactly when we're going to hear back. I, they never said exactly when they, we were going to hear back from them. Does anybody have any experience with USDA rural development grants and turnaround times? It's always longer than they say. <laughs> I, 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 I thought they told us in, it would be May, but I can't really, I, I'm yeah. not sure. But. That seems And just reasonable. one side note, if I can. Um, when we, we're going to both be applying for different things for the northern border, but I think we could possibly offer each other letters of support for each of our applications, yeah. which would be helpful. Because I, that will, again, demonstrate that we're collaborating, and I think we should be, if everybody's comfortable here, I think we should both be saying we're collaborating on the process of getting this to be a reality. So I've got um, Northern Border and USA Rural Development are happy to work together. And if you're applying for an NBRC planning grant and a USDA planning grant, <coughs> informing each agency that you're doing that and telling them that you want to combine things is a positive. They don't say, oh, well, they're going to give it to you. We won't have to. They say, oh, this is symbiosis. We like this. Mm -hmm. So if we haven't done that yet, we should. Okay. We do have to be mindful, typically anyway, I don't know the specifics of the northern border, but you can't match federal money with federal money, no. typically. So you can't use, you oh, I thought, match. Well, the, when I went to the northern border thing, I thought that Tim... Wait a minute. Tim Turney said you could. You, it was in one direction you could and not the other. I think we matched some northern border with USDA money, didn't we? Yeah. That would be yeah. great. If you can do yeah, that. That's right. That's yeah, can. Right. So you can match federal money to federal money. Yep. That's fantastic. You can't match NBRC money to USDA, but you can do it in the other direction. Uh, uh. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
interesting. Well, that's good because it kind of works out chronologically that way. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. We didn't need it then, but we'll need it next. Yeah, by the time we're done, we're going to have so much money, we don't need to do feasibility. We just build. <laughs> now you sound like the arm. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else? Any questions on uh, USDA uh, planning grant? Like I said, I expect to have, uh, once I have that document from you, I have some uh, bank account information and stuff to provide, I need to print out. Um, they wanted more specific details about what's actually in our bank account, because we said we have X amount <coughs> that $15,000 or twelve five that we were joking about before. Yeah, we don't actually have that full twelve five. Mm -hmm. so, but they're, they're looking for, like, show us what you actually have Oops. and so we're going to show what we actually have and mm -hmm. and we'll adjust it, it is, it is what it is I'm still yeah. Yeah. yeah okay uh, moving along I'm going to go back to I just saw an email from Becca and she's uh, not going to be here tonight so I'm going to do a brief treasurer's report um, there is a um, some strangeness on the part of the online um, donation collection site where they want to charge us as a for-profit entity. They can't wrap their brains around the fact that we're a non-profit but not a 501. Mm -hmm. um, so I sent Becca all of the uh, IRS guidelines on the, which section of the federal code that municipalities fall under and why it is tax deductible and why we're a non-profit and so on, hoping that they will get that resolved. Um, uh, there's $4,300 in the, in the checking account right now. Uh, I don't have the savings account uh, numbers up in front of me at the moment. There's $2,281 in the um, online donations account uh, for a total of $6,581. I could be missing something if I, have, um, if I don't have the whole, the whole picture of what Becca would normally look at. Great. All right, moving along. Um, Committees report back. Was there any, were there any committee meetings since we last met? I'll take that as a note. <laughs> Short meeting tonight. Let's go for it. Uh, review of back order items, committee assignments, and membership. Um, so um, those of you newly attending, we have uh, three standing committees. We have a business development committee. We have a policy. What's it called? It's just a policy, policy committee. committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm policy committee and we have a finance committee so if either of you um, skip or Tom if either of you are interested in joining those um, you <coughs> certainly can feel free to raise your hand and let me know Name those committees again sure uh, we've got business development which is a little bit more like operational sure. stuff finance which is more uh, connected with the treasurer and the other stuff that goes on there and policy which is policies Business development would be great. Okay, so um, I move to um, name Skip to the Business Development Committee. Uh, Jerry Diamatidis is the chair of that committee. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, seconded by Phil. So we have a motion, so I've, I'm also secretarying tonight. Okay, so because we have a remote, um, a remote board member, um, we will do this. Um, I will just go uh, around the room. David. Um, aye. Yes. So, I. Bob. Aye. 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 Sure. <laughs> and uh, Jonathan. Aye. Aye. Excellent. So we've got unanimous. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, any other committee assignments, anything we need to um, push off to committees or ask them to do in the meantime? Are we, is part of the next meeting is reorg, right? Yes. So we should probably address, we'll address all that then. In um, terms of like, because I know like with well, policy, it's you just, and I are in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. I mean, should, Alan might stay on. He's, that, he's going to be a question. delegate. And, okay. Yeah. Well, he's going to be okay. alternate. Or alternate, alternate. yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. We can wait till the, I mean, there's not pending anything, right. or there's nothing. So we can wait till the re next meeting and then we can at least try to appoint one more. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like a plan. So, um, 
Looking at the, the back burner items, uh, there's the equipment policy that could eventually maybe land in the policy committee. Um, probably not a huge fire burning under that one for right now. Um, I had a meeting in Waterbury today. There is interest from them. I expect I'll probably be at their next select board meeting and they will likely be applying in time for the uh, May meeting. Um, there was also uh, somebody who lived in Duxbury who at the same time was saying, I'm going to talk to the Duxbury Select Board too because they seem interested. <laughs> so this is maybe where we have the conversation about okay. how big do we want to be. Yeah, so do we want to be roughly around the same number as EC Fiber? So if we take Waterbury, <coughs> Duxbury, it would kind of make sense to take more town, town unless you get a, a little kind of hook there. <laughs> more town's being wired by the more town utility. Part of the southern part is, but there's still large swaths of people who will probably not be not be served by Whitsfield, Whitsfield Telecom. Um, and there was a little bit of reluctance when I was at the select board was a year and a half ago, almost well, a year ago, and change. Um, they might they might be interested if we ask them again, say that you know all your neighbors are joining us, be like the cool kids. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then looking at Washington, so we're at 17 now. So if we get Waterbury, 18, Duxbury, 19, Moortown, 20, Washington, 21. We I mean, previously talked about going through Stowe to get around to Cabot too. So you're in Stowe. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah well, to, to get to Elmore. Now with Woodbury. Or Elmore. Sorry, Elmore. Yeah. 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 Why is the linchpin for Elmore and Stowe? Because there's no way you can run out <laughs> Route 12 and meet our expense constraints. Right. So. <coughs> plus the scenic beauty. I will. Sure. Plus the scenic beauty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or truth. 12. Oh, 12, yeah. I, see, I mean, I'll tell you one thing. I've seen more unnatural action moose on that road than anything else. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> we didn't need that visual. It was good. No, I like that. <laughs> so um, I, 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 think, I think if we did Waterbury, Duxbury, Moortown, and Washington, that would be where my comfort level would be start to be exceeded if I were to be farther from there. I don't know what anybody else thinks. Or is that still is that too much? Uh, well, there's, what a, about there's a time what constraint to, to, to all of this, too. I mean, yes. folks, folks have got to realize that you can, you can only get so, my, so many miles going at a time. I mean, I don't know how quickly we're going to ramp up and how much money is going to come in our direction, but that, you know, they, 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 folks might want to sign on, but you know, somebody's going to be in year seven and eight of this thing. Sure. And if it's one of the original folks that ends up in being year 12, you know, I mean, I'm altruistic, but, I, you know, I, it, 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 folks might be better served be, to be in s smaller independent clusters. So. And, and, and I was clear to the folks in Waterbury, they're 90% they're served by cable. They're also, wow. they're also doing a complete refurb of their downtown, taking all of their utility poles, all of their sewer, all of their water, and they're doing, redoing all of it in Waterbury Center. It's all going underground. Wow. So I said... Waterbury, Waterbury Village and Waterbury Center? Uh, I'm sorry, Waterbury Village, okay. not Waterbury. I'm, <laughs> Okay. Uh, conflating the two. Okay. No, well, Waterbury Village is right. all that stuff's going underground, and I said construction costs go. Kind is of that a limiting factor for us? In other words, if we're not there when they do uh, when they do the bearing, it's past. I mean, I mean, we'll, I mean, will, will, there, will there be an ability to pull fiber later? Yeah. All right. Only if they stick the conduit. Oh, well, well, there's there's a well, there, there is a bunch of fiber out. that's going under there right now, okay. and there should be space in that. I mean, I, I, I didn't ask. It was not scope that they, they got to be thinking of it. Who's ever doing yeah. utility they, work? They have to, but, 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 but companies, let's say First Light, or um, might be saying, <coughs> this is our conduit. We're paying for it, and it's ours, and we're not sharing it with anybody. There's, and Comcast might say the same thing for theirs. There's, there, there's three different fiber bundles that are, that are going through there. There's, a, there's <coughs> First Light, there's Consolidated, and... Comcast? Comcast. Comcast must be. Yeah. So it's there's right. there's there's middle mile fiber there, all over the place. Right. So I don't know if they're sharing a conduit or what's going on. That. That's that. I just I said, you're at ninety percent cable coverage. You're not looking like an attractive, you know, initial place that we're going to start. I said, you know, I don't want to take anything off the table. But I said, just realize that if we're starting from the south, which it appears that we may. Hey, um, hey, hey. Let's say what, what Waterbury does not look 
much more attractive than Montpelier, just saying. And well, they, although, as a pass through, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So we might build down the middle, right down the middle of your served area to get to Duxbury mm -hmm. and use Stillwood. Right. So um, they're they're aware of that, I, I, I think, and they. Um, but on the other hand, they feel like they they need to have some sort of forward motion of any of any sort. And I explained to them the difference between the middle mile fiber that First Light has there and why First Light's not going to hook up, you know, John Smith on the corner of Main Street um, with fiber ever. So, um, agenda item for the next time, perhaps, is um, we've sort of nibbled around this, but we've never really gotten to. Uh, that's a, yeah, that's a, well, that's a tough question, really. It's, um, Would we want to? Just before doing a feasibility study, right? Well, there's a good question. Well, but, well, as our feasibility study, if Waterbury joins before we have a feasibility study, they will be part of it. Right. If Duxbury joins, then they will be part of it. But if they're not part of it, if we launch the feasibility study and we say here are the currently the 17 towns, then we're going to be looking at the 17 towns, and the other folks are going to be an afterthought. I don't see why the consultant can't consider. Yeah. Okay. Neighboring towns in their report and say we recommend for this and against that because of these reasons. Okay. So, so I mean that's just another kind I mean, of layer of complexity. And, and it might be useful to us before we vote someone in to find out what the results of that study are. If the if Waterbury showed that thirty five percent of the residences and eighty percent of the businesses would take, uh -huh. it's a lot cheaper to run it there than anywhere else. Perhaps. It's the same thing in Montpelier. Yeah. So, um, Jeremy, let me just mention what that co op I talked about in Missouri. What they ended up doing is having three or four towns of 2,500 people or whatever come to them, even though they weren't in the co op service story, and want to buy into getting hooked up. And, it, and those towns brought a 90% take rate um, because they weren't getting adequate service in, from, from the cable. So it's just a bit of information. <laughs> And that demand aggregation software that you've been yeah. talking about for a while, Michael. That's uh, so. So I want to reiterate what I said before about um, contractors. Um, this this is going to be a growth industry in Vermont. I don't know if the contractors are going to be able to meet the demand. If we if all these potential CDBs are successfully getting funded, there's going to be a lot of competing projects for manpower. And, that may figure into our question of how big we want to be as well. Um, that's all. Okay, so future agenda item? <coughs> okay, so I, th I think we, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it can be considered by the, the feasibility study too, but I think we should keep coming back to this. Um, so an, another thing related to the, um, the May 14th meeting, I will, as I mentioned before, I will not be here. Um, I'm still happy to serve as chair if you will have me again, but I will need to attend remotely. I'll need to attend remotely. It'll be midnight local time, but that's, <laughs> that's fine. That's, that's doable. Um, so I will need to coordinate with somebody, maybe, maybe you, Phil, and just uh, Skype me in or something and we'll... Um, I'll attend the beginning part of the meeting and then and turn it over to whoever gets elected vice chair from there. Put that on everybody's radar. Uh, okay. Um, Rama's not coming, so I, we're going to skip that financial policies item. Like that. Um, approval of March 12th meeting minutes. Anybody have any feedback or changes <coughs> to the... March 12th meeting minutes. And I will make my suggestion. Um, in number six, I will um, report this to Becca before we take these out of draft. On uh, number six, it says that uh, we were awarded a Think Vermont Innovation Grant for $12,700. It should be $12,500. That's the only change. So I move that we, uh, that we accept the uh, meeting minutes of the March 12, 2019 Governing Board meeting with the previously noted change. Second. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to do it by roll call. David, start us off again. Abstain. Okay. 
Uh, that wasn't the meeting. So, uh, uh, I'll have to abstain. I wasn't here. Okay. So motion passes unanimously <coughs> with uh, some abstentions. Okay. Um, so for those of you new to the board, we will do a, um, a round table. Everybody gets a chance to weigh in with anything they like before we wrap things up. So we'll start us off. David? I'm happy. Okay. Jerry? I'm good. Bob? No issues. Tom? Things are moving. Okay. Ask. Ask. Okay. I'll, I'll reiterate something, and that is not with an immediate time frame, but to consider what we do with the Montpelier's of the world being the representative alternate from Montpelier about what does it look like to establish a competitive uh, system. Okay. Tom? I'm happy. Good. Yeah, I'm good. See. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So with all the grants that I've, I've taken some notes here, this is my first meeting, and uh, so we have several grants that we're applying for, several studies that we're going to be ongoing. Is there a document that exists similar to a project plan that has milestone, milestones, past dependencies, uh, due dates, anything so, like that? So we, while we've been uh, approved for the Think Vermont Innovation Grant, which is $12,500 with a match, or an expected match from us of $12,500, um, um, ap that application that I submitted did indeed have a, um, did indeed have a sequence of milestones and like expectations for how we would spend the money. That's sort of been shifted slightly into being supporting funds for the USDA grant. That USDA grant is still percolating through the through the process and um, will have its own milestones and such as well. I was thinking more in a strategic oh. viewpoint. We're building out, you said you're building out the southern part of, of, of CD fiber. Is that in some sort of project plan? That was, that was hypothetical based on this uh, proposal that we got from ValleyNet, which okay. we haven't technically seen yet. Okay. So they're saying this is something that they want to do <clears throat> um, we may we may get to a point where we have something a bit more concrete. We're still a bit flying by the seat of our pants until we get a business plan and the feasibility study and the and the survey that David's were sort of on the snooze button for. But I, I should we should add that to the yes, next agenda too. So what you're what you're asking for is the next step that we're going or that we're looking to, to venture into. Okay. Did the annual report we did have some of this? The annual report that well that well, that came out in yeah, like, no, but October. You probably never seen it. No, I, 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 I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I can I can send that back out. Um. Did Did you get a um, Were you on the distribution list of board members of the grant application that we sent out? Good question. You were. I was. Yeah. You should. You should have been. <laughs> yeah. I think Rebecca requested that was just a point of um, Tom would be put on until the next meeting in May. Uh, okay. The email list and the. Well, I'll, I'll look at. Give me your email. Give me your email address. I didn't see anything. So I will send that annual report. Um, that was the statutorily required report that we have to provide to all of the member municipalities about what it is that we're doing. And I did have that high, that kind of big picture. Yeah. Um, um, a big picture of what we are planning on doing. So it's too, really, it's too soon for a tactical plan, or yeah, we're still sort of trying, to, still trying to figure out exactly how we're going to attack this thing. That's probably what the feasibility study is going to generate. Yeah, that's that really what we we're hiring out. Letting somebody tell us. Letting somebody tell you. Jeremy, anything you want to add? No. To, to focus, to focus the. The, the mines, you know. Otherwise, there's there's 30, 30 folks sitting around the thirty four folks sitting around the room. You will get thirty seven ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why I ask is I was involved in a project just like this during what what I do for a living, and uh, you know, building out fiber. In this case, it was to the curb, and you know, not to a house. So uh, I'm somewhat familiar with what you guys are going through, and the uh, the tasks involved. So. If you need any help with that business development or 
Awesome. Or I'm <laughs> going to get your email. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, John and Marshfield, anything that you want to add? Any roundtable stuff? Uh, not at this time. Thank you, Jeremy. Sure. Hey, Jeremy. Hey. I passed, but I'd like to say something. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Are we surprised? Um, it's about the funding. Um, so right now we're going for grants. We're getting up people to make donations. We're bootstrapping at the beginning. The whole idea of that VITA legislation is to help organizations like us get off the ground. It's, it's not going to be available to us two times or three times. Right. And no other such things are going to be available to us two or three times, second time or third time. We're going to have to self-fund at some point. But once we have three years of financial records and, you know, and revenue coming in, we can go to the bond market, we can go to the banks, and they will take care of us. We'll have to pay the price. It won't be free. It won't be free money anymore. But we'll be able to do it. And we just also keep that in mind. This is, just, this is just getting us off Do you the think that if we follow this path and, and are successful in getting a VITA loan, that the build up from the VITA loan, let's pick a number, a million and a half, two million dollars from VITA, mm -hmm. would, would the build up from that and the timing from that be the basis on which we can grow or is there, an, or is there a time period when we build out with the VITA money and then nothing happens? In other words, you see what I'm saying? Is there, is yeah. there needs to be a, that sort of intermediate there, there because we don't be. have the track record right after we finish the VITA bill. I, you know, I imagine that, that if we do a VITA we do a VITA loan and an NBRC follow-on grant to keep us rolling to get to that three-year point where we can go to the banks. Okay. That may be the formula, but at some point we're going to just have to start borrowing money to do well, this. Yeah, they, and we're not going to get grants. And whether it's the feasibility study, you know, the, the EC Fiber model is if, if we do go out and do some marketing and identify those people that will write checks for $100,000 to participate in awesome, CV but Fiber. But, but yeah, our, uh, our, do we you know, when will that discussion happen? Do we envision doing that and start? That's, that's really hard. It's, it already, <laughs> oh. We already had the discussion and we didn't come up with any of those folks. But which I guess. Well, that's I think, yeah, when it becomes more concrete. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. So how is the take up take rate going in Crafts Ferry? Um, we have tremendous interest, and we've had all kinds of obstacles satisfying it because of problems with both the state of Vermont and the contractor Eustace, mm. and weather. There's a lot of conduits oh, yeah. waiting for fiber that are full of ice. Um, and then there's some, it's complicated, but there's, there's some workers who refuse to do things we're asking them to do because it's not the way they're used to doing things. <coughs> so we're like working, there's some systems things that mm -hmm. still have to get resolved. So we have some customers hooked up, but not a lot of them, and we have all these people saying me, me, me. The well, level of interest is good. The interest is there. Oh, good. That's all yeah. So yeah. that, that's another thing, I mean, expectations and delivering is yeah, another you big thing. <laughs> expect everything's going to take twice as long as you think, at least. Okay. 7.45, I move to adjourn. I'm not going to do over on the table because I'm not hearing anybody screaming. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>